Good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. First up, I want to say thanks for inviting me here today to be able to talk about something I'm really passionate about. Um, that's my job, okay? <laughs> um, you know, I love being a district commander in Galveston. Um, you know, I'm kind of blessed that uh, I've actually got to, I was the deputy here from 2004 to 2006, and I got to come back to be the commander. So of my 26-year career, I've got to spend five of it here in the uh, Houston Galveston area, and really appreciate that. In fact, uh, this is where we, my family plans to put down our roots here in the, in the very near future. So, uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about Texas ports, um, and it's not just Texas ports I'm going to talk to you about today. But I'm going to talk to you about the whole Corps of Engineers and what the Galveston District's doing in the Houston Galveston area, as, as well as all along the Texas coastline. But uh, I'll talk quite a bit about the ports because that's pretty much our our major muscle movement. So just some background information, Corps of Engineers, this is how we're, we're spread out. Um, you know, science, uh, 44 districts, um, those districts are you know, geographically dispersed across the United States. We have a district in Europe, we have a district in Korea, we've got a couple districts in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan right now, and that footprint's getting a little bit smaller as we, as we start to scale down the war effort. Um, but you know the districts are all these di districts are responsible for basically civil works functions of the Corps of, Corps of Engineers, um, and we do a lot of work for the military, mainly military construction for the Army and the Air Force. We're the lead component for for that. Um, bringing into my region here, Southwestern Division, Galveston District. We also have Fort Worth District, uh, Tulsa District, and Little Rock. My boss is Brigadier, Gen Brigadier General Kula, and his headquarters is up in Dallas. <coughs> So here's a, this is the Galveston District. This is what I command. So a little over 50,000 square miles. Um, it, it covers from Brownsville, Georgia, all the way to the Louisiana border. Well, actually, a little bit inside the Louisiana border because our boundary is by watershed. So the Sabine, the Sabine River boundary watershed. Um, do a lot of work with New Orleans District. We partner quite a bit on the Sabine River. Um, they're, they're the, when it comes to a permit in Louisiana, they're the lead the lead element for permits in Louisiana um, with a lot of input from, from my staff. Over a thousand miles of ship channel, okay? Um, that's deep draft and shallow draft. Um, you know, the, uh, and we're gonna talk quite a bit about the ports. And then, uh, you know, you look at uh, the, what makes Texas unique is that thing called the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. So you, the district has 423 miles of the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. Starts, starts in Brownsville, runs all the way over into the Florida Panhandle, our 423 miles. Um, if, you equated the t if you took the tonnage on the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway in Texas alone, it'd be equal to about the number four port in the nation by tonnage. Um, it makes this, this, this petrochemical complex along the coast into a system because it links all the deep draft um, ports together and gives you know, industry an option. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we, we work through the slides. Uh, Galveston District. So we've been around for 133 years. Okay, um, you know, established in 1880 for the sole purposes of facilitating navigation along the Texas coastline, specifically Houston and the Sabine H.S. Um, waterways. 1900, big storm on Galveston Island wipes the island out. The Corps gets the mission to rebuild Galveston Island and protect Galveston Island. And that's where we started with the construction of the seawall. I love these old pictures of the seawall because when you you know, I stood, I was down here yesterday and I stood on the beach and uh, you look back at the seawall and you only got about seven feet of that thing exposed, okay? Uh, and you don't realize that it's, you got about another 15 or 20 feet that's, that's going back underneath you. Um, and then what's really interesting is you look behind that picture, that's picture now that being Seawall Boulevard, okay? That's how much, how much the Corps raised that part of the island. Um, as part, of this, uh, as part of this mission to protect Galveston Island, preserve Galveston Island. Um, fast forward from the 1900s to the 1930s, historic flooding in downtown Houston, okay? Um, nation turns to the Corps of Engineers and says, we want you to fix it. So out of that, um, you know, was born our relationship with Harris County Flood Control District. And the two big projects that came out of that were the Attics and Barker Dams that are, you know, that sit out on the west side of this, this city right now. Um, yeah, those dams have been there for over 60 years. I think the last one was completed in 47. Um, you know, right now their their flood damage is averted because those facilities are there is around six billion dollars. Okay, so they've more than paid for themselves. And I will tell you that they're both ready for some major restoration and modernization. And we'll talk a little bit more when we get to that part uh, about what we're doing there. 
Um, fast forward again to the 70s, okay, and you got clean water, clean air comes along, and the core picks up its mission, its regulatory mission, okay. So, uh, you know, that joins us at the hip where we do our 404 permitting and our Section 10 permitting. I um, mean, a lot of you in the room, if you've been in the construction business, you probably um, hit one of those along the way somewhere, or that stumbling block. So, um, and then, you know, it brings us to where we are today, um, continuing to manage all this. So this is my program. Um, you know, what you're seeing there are dollars. That black line shows number of employees that I have, okay? Um, this is a overall program. Now you see the big spikes in 2009 and 2010 and 11. That's, that was the, uh, you know, Hurricane Ike was in 2008, okay? We got the plus up in nine. We did a whole bunch of work, re disaster recovery work, similar to what's happening, what you're seeing happen in New York right now. And then in 10, along came the, uh, um, the ARA money, okay? And we got a big chunk of ARA money that we were able to use for a bunch of projects uh, and to move projects along. I think one of the, the biggest projects that we did was a Texas City deepening project. Took that channel from 40 feet to 45 feet. Um, uh, finished that in about, channel depth down to, it was done in about 18 months. Um, and then you can see where the Texas, where the uh, ARA funding is starting to dry up and then 11 and, you know, and 12 and 13. And uh, right now, with sitting with sequestration, that's kind of a soft number because we've been told anywhere from eight to 12% cut in our budget. Um, right now, with the hiring freeze that went effect in December, I'm really down to uh, 300 people on board right now. Um, I need to hire some folks, but uh, haven't gotten the approval to hire as we wait and see what the final, the final uh, budget's gonna be for 13 and then, uh, you know, what, what are the end results of the cuts that we're gonna have to take. So, um, a, lot of, a lot of folks sitting out there that are kind of antsy right now. Um, you know, we'll figure it out. Well, we'll know something in the next two weeks because the CR ends on the 27th of March and if they don't do something by the 27th of March, government's gonna shut down. So, um, but, uh, oops, sorry. So these are, this is my mission. This is what I do, okay, and you know, Really, it breaks down into my, ba my, my major business lines. So navigation, flood risk management, um, ecosystem restoration, and then regulatory emergency management. These last two, I, uh, I call myself an enabler for those. In other words, I, I don't, I'm, a I'm a coastal engineering district, okay? So all things that I do best are coastal construction type projects. Military construction, interagency support, that's a different, set of engineers with a different set of design skills. Um, I partner with Fort Worth District and uh, Little Rock and Tulsa. They have those folks on board. Really what I do is a construction management on those. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as we go along. But uh, I'm more of an enabler on those last two. So here's my deep draft ports, okay. Um, the little number you see there is uh, where they rank nationwide, nationally. Uh, Houston's uh, number two. Okay, for overall tonnage, I see Charlie in the back, so number one for exports, correct, Charlie? And foreign tonnage. And foreign tonnage, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a significant contribution to the national economy, okay? Texas is the number one state in the nation for maritime commerce. A lot of people don't say, wow, Texas, number one state in the nation for maritime commerce? I will tell you that the benefits that Texas reaps is in liquid, bulk, and chemical. Okay, um, it's not in containers, although the Port of Houston makes, does a pretty good business in containers, okay? They're the number one port in the Gulf for, for containers uh, and soon to get bigger, but um, that's not where the major benefits are. The major benefits are what comes off of uh, the, the petrochemical. And I like to use the example, you have a deep draft vessel that comes through the Houston Ship Channel, okay? Hits Exxon Mobil, okay? Gets refined into something. It may go out by pipeline, Okay, byproduct may be put on a barge. That barge goes down to GIWW to Freeport, hits Dow Chemical at Freeport, or it could go to Corpus, or it could go to Beaumont, um, hits another facility, gets refined into something, gets put back on a deep draft vessel, and now exported overseas. Okay, um, or it could hit another pipeline and go somewhere else in the nation to another facility to be used. So it's a system that's, uh, about distribution, and it's about what, you know, what comes in, what do we maximize here, and then what, how do we make a buck on it going back out towards the, towards the GDP. Um, I will tell you that 
as you look at the shallow draft, these are your shallow draft harbors. Uh, we, you know, um, Eagle Ford shell development, Barnett shell, and Permian Basin shell is changing this dynamic, and it's changing it quickly. Little sleepy port at Victoria, okay, 18 months ago, didn't ship a barrel of oil, okay. Last month they shipped a million barrels of oil, okay, and it's all coming from Eagle Ford. It comes by truck, hits their port, it goes from truck to barge. They're in the process of building a tank farm down there right now, so they can go truck to tank to barge, and eventually they want to get a pipeline that would bring it right to the port. Once it hits the port of Victoria by barge, it can go north or south. It can go south to Corpus, to the refinery complex there. It can come north to Houston, to, to uh, Freeport, all the way up to Beaumont, and even into Louisiana. It's wherever the buyers are, um, they'll move that commodity. The, um, the other game changer that's happening with the, on the navigation side is the Panama Canal, okay? And part of Panama, it's not so much about, uh, you know, yeah, there's gonna be bigger ships you can take in there and the depth's gonna change, you know, it's 50 feet is, is what they're gonna be able to, to draft through the new canal, but it's about the wider canal. And for the Texas coastline, that means you're now gonna be able to take LNG ships through the canal, which you can't do right now. So you've got three LNG facilities that are already built that are in the process of going through their permit, getting their permits to, they were built to import. Now they're in the process of, uh, of getting permitted to export and they want to expand because you've got a lot of LNG that's coming off of Permian, Barnett, um, and even Eagle Ford. That's about $18 billion just in LNG private investment alone, okay, for those three facilities. And then uh, there's another facility that's going through the permitting process at Corpus Christi. Um, and there's one that's fallen through the permitting process for Brownsville. So potentially two more facilities. Um, I will tell you, Chenier is the group that wants to build at Corpus and they're, they're pretty, pretty serious. Um, they've been in a couple times to talk to us about the expansion of their facility and, uh, um, on the Sabine and then also you know, looking, leaning forward on what they're gonna have to do down at Corpus. And those are some pretty significant, uh, significant projects. So, a um, lot of opportunity. And, uh, you know, it's, it's how the nation is willing to respond to this opportunity. I think that will, that will define um, what's happening. I will tell you, we've worked, over the last 18 months, we've developed a very close relationship with TxDOT. TxDOT is our local sponsor for the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway. And, uh, <laughs> You know, one of the things they came to us and said, okay, uh, right now in the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, it's, it's authorized a 12-foot depth. I get about 24 to $27 million a year for 423 miles of channel, okay? And all I can guarantee industry is nine feet. I can't give, I don't have enough money to maintain 12 feet. TxDOT asked us, well, what if we, what if we, the state, made an investment into the channel? Um, how much would it be? We said it'd be about $60 million. And then they said, well, how much to, to continue to maintain a 12-foot channel. And we said, mm, you know, take our, our 24 to 27, you probably have to add another 15 or 20 every year to maintain a 12-foot channel. But the benefits jump for industry by about 180, 200 million dollars, okay? Just by being able to, to load barges to 12 feet versus nine feet. And right now we generate about nine billion dollars of commerce a year just between my two locks on the Colorado and the Brazos River. So and that, that's about $192 million a day. So uh, um, you sit there and you watch those barges go by and you realize it's not sand and gravel. It's, it's a high dollar petro product. Oh, there is a lot of sand that's going down to Eagle Ford now, frac sand. So uh, it's, uh, these are just some support statistics. Um, you can see where they, and these are 2011 numbers. Um, the 12 numbers won't be published probably till later on this year. They're still consolidating all that data. Um, but this just shows you how the, the Texas ports rank out. And again, number one in the state for, uh, for uh, number one in the nation for overall commerce. So this is, an, I, I show this slide because when you talk about why, why Texas? Why, why, did, why does this industry come to Texas? And it comes to Texas because you have the existing infrastructure that's here, okay? Um, you look to the West Coast, and if you think you're gonna build a new refinery, 
or anything on the West Coast. It's just not going to happen. Okay? Um, they don't want it. You know, the people don't want it. The environmental movement doesn't want it. It's not going to happen on the West Coast. East Coast. East Coast is built out. Okay? Largely built out. Um, so it's not going to happen on the East Coast. So where does, it, where does that leave you? It leaves you the Gulf Coast. Okay? The infrastructure is already here. Industry knows it. Industry right now is making this investment into expanding their facilities. Okay? Because they're, it's reliable, it's reliable um, waterways, um, reliable ports, and uh, a state that counts on this revenue that's willing to make an investment where necessary. Um, so, and then you have this pipeline distribution system where you can bring it into a Texas port and really reach anywhere else in the nation. Um, so this kind of drills into my funding a little bit more just on the navigation side, okay? Um, you can see where, what the national average for the, for the Corps of Engineers has been. Navigation funding back in 2008, we we're really fat around you know two billion dollars, and that c includes construction, all those accounts, you know, general investigations. That's my planning account. That's the money we use to look at the how do you how do you take a channel, make a channel deeper or wider to accommodate Panama. The construction that's the account we build off of. Then operations and maintenance is uh, is uh, you know how do you maintain what you already built. So you know our funding has been. Uh, well, it's decreasing, but th you know we got the bump in 13, and the bump in 13 was really because OMB took a different approach to looking at channels. They said we're only going to invest in channels that have high value and high return to the nation. Okay, um, when you start looking at the Texas, the Texas ports, well, you know four in the top ten, that's value to the nation. They generate money back for the nation. So we had some winners. You know, we had some winners. Houston was a winner. Freeport did well, Corpus did well, Sabine H.S. Waterway did well, but we had some losers too, okay? Um, OMB looked at numbers for Channel to Victoria, okay? So they looked at numbers that were a year ago, they weren't shipping much oil a year ago, okay? Now they're shipping, you know, a million barrels a month. So little Channel to Victoria was a, was a loser, okay? And we worked very closely with the port at, at Victoria to, to go to Washington and tell their story tell it to the core, tell it to um, the people in OMB, and they got it, okay? Remember, in Washington, they, it's only as good as the data that they have at their fingertips, okay? And they're not gonna pick up the phone and, and make a telephone call. So sometimes it's, it's very important that we make those trips to, to tell people, tell our story, okay? And that's what I'm doing today, I'm telling my story to you all, so you can go out there and tell my story too, okay? So, um, so 13, we, we got a little bump, but we, got, we hit this thing called a CRA, <laughs> Continuing Resolution. We didn't get a budget, um, so we'll see how that plays out. Um, you know, it's just the realities of, uh, of working within the system. So this is what we do with all that money. You know, um, everybody thinks it's about dredging. It's more than dredging, okay? And uh, I tell people, you know, if you looked at it, I call it system health. So you have a health of a system like Houston, okay? Um, it's about having, it's about being able to maintain channel capacity, which the ports want, okay? Um, it's about being able to maintain placement area capacity, which is where do I put the mud in the out years, because I can't just put it anywhere. So I gotta have, maintain capacity. Um, and then it's about being environmentally sustainable, because, uh, you know, the EPA does look over my shoulder very closely. And I'll tell you, we're pretty, we're, we're really blessed um, when you look at the, the material that we dredge along the Texas coastline, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relatively clean material. Um, unlike, you know, our brothers in the Northeast um, or even in the Great Lakes who have a, you know, material that's con heavily contaminated um, and when they dispose of it, they've got to treat it like a, a hazardous toxic waste. Um, we're, not quite, we're not quite there yet. And we've done all of our, you know, we've got testing that goes all the way back to the 70s that can show you what we've, what we've handled and touched. So we're, we've been pretty we've been in pretty good shape for that. So, and then we work very closely with the Coast Guard on making sure that we maintain navigation safety. So these are just some of the high priority projects that we got going on right now. Um, so, people ask me a lot of times, is Texas ready for Panama? And I say yes and no. Okay, yes from the from the respect that every port that wants to do that wants to go deeper has come to us to talk about a study. 
Okay, so, and they've either got a study in progress or it's complete. So right now we've got Sabine H.S. Waterway, which wants to go to 48 feet. They're waiting on word of authorization. And I don't know if you've all watched the news, but that's something that Congress is gonna talk about this week is whether they're gonna do a word of bill this year. Um, we've got Freeport that's, uh, uh, again, they're, they're going to 55, but they're waiting for authorization on word of their studies done. Corpus is already authorized to 52, it hasn't been built yet. And then um, Brownsville, we're still working on that report. We should finish that up probably uh, spring of next year. And then we have a study that we're starting for the Port of Houston, which is the upper part of the, the ship channel. Right now, Port of Houston is 45 feet up to the Beltway 8 bridge. Um, from Beltway 8 to the turning basin, it's only 40 feet. Um, we've got authority to start a study this year but never got the money because we're under the continuing resolution. You know, it's like a do loop, right? Uh, one of two steps forward, continuing resolution, take a step back, okay? Um, so we'll continue to work um, whether we can get that started after Congress figures out how we're gonna move into the, the rest of the year. So, and then right now at La Quinta, we've got a, de a deepening project that we're doing at, Qu at La Quinta. That's uh, uh, it's an offshoot of the Corpus main channel. Um, we're taking it to 39 feet. The port right now holds a permit to go to 45 feet. And we're trying to get a study started in 15 to look at 52 feet. So that would give their whole system 52 feet. Um, so things that we're working for. So back to the question, is, is Texas ready for Panama? Yes, every port that wants to go deeper has done a study. No, nothing's been constructed yet. Okay, so. and. Uh, And then these are just some of the economic factors. Charlie, don't hammer my numbers here. You know, he, he's, got a, he's got one study that says, you know, Houston alone generates 1.3 million, you know, million jobs. So, um, just 1.1. What's that? Just 1.1. <laughs> no, just 1.1. 1 .1. So, but uh, these, were, these were, you know, you know, what, what my economists are coming up with. But what's interesting to note here is when we talked about operations and maintenance and, and, and you know, go back to Houston pays in about $130 million a year to the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund, okay? And of that $130 million, they get about $25 million back, okay? So I get about $25 million to maintain the Houston Ship Channel every year at 45 feet. Now, Port of Houston wants to guarantee their customers 45 or greater because that's where they can they maximize their value, okay? But when they get one foot of draft restriction, this is what they start to lose. So, you know, they're losing $188 million a year, okay, when they start to have to start to lighten and lighter vessels um, offshore. And now we're talking about liquid. You can't, and it gets worse for LNG because you can't, you can't lighter or lighten an LNG, well, you cannot lighter a LNG vessel, okay? It's got to come into port and hook up. So if we don't have draft to those facilities up in the Sabine or at Freeport, then that ship goes somewhere else, okay? And then, the, the, again, the state loses the benefits, okay? Containers, Charlie, I don't know, can you lighten container ships? <laughs> not, the not, the, not, the, not the preferred method of, uh, of doing that offshore. So um, uh, the, the point is, we build it, we got to maintain it, but we got to keep the balance and the health of the system too. And it gets really tough when the dollars um, either stay flatlined or decrease, but the cost of doing business continues to rise. So one of the, the bills that's going through the, uh, the Senate right now is the uh, RAMP Act, which is Restore America's Maritime Promise. Um, and that's proposed, that proposed bill is to open up the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund Okay, because the fund collects about $1.6 billion a year. And only about 800 to a billion comes back for actual maintenance. Okay, the other 600 million is held in treasury. Okay, well, treasury doesn't hold money, so the other 600 million is used to offset other um, programs within the, within the federal government. Although there's a, supposedly there's a kitty out there somewhere that says this is how much is in the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund. Um, the Inland Waterways Trust Fund is very much the same way. Um, Inland Waterways Trust Fund is funded through a, a fuel tax on, on industry. So industry 
you know, all the, the towing industry, you know, every time they, they buy their fuel, there's a tax that's put on them. That money goes off into a fund that comes back into the system for maintenance repair of locks, dams that are on the system, inland, that make the inland system operate. And uh, right now, that's not keeping up with the, uh, with the backlog of things that need to happen. So, Shifting gears out of navigation, um, flood risk management. So I've got nine different watersheds that, that um, touch the district, um, everywhere from, you know, from the Sabine to the Rio Grande. Um, I like to tell people I'm the catcher, okay? So <laughs> everything, goes, everything else goes you know, uh, upstream of this at, in that brown area, that's Fort Worth district, that's my brother in Fort Worth who managed that. And I, I tell him, I said, hey, don't send it to me too fast, okay? Of course, in a drought, we haven't really had to worry about this, okay? Um, but there's been times in the past where Fort Worth has had to dump water down the Brazos and the Colorado rivers. Um, and with, our, with, with us having very limited ability to do any kind of control on that. So um, this kind of fits back into you know, the mission that we have for emergency management. Also, we have seven hurricane protection systems um, along the coast that, we, that we've constructed and that we um, work very closely with the sponsors for the maintenance on those. We have the system at Port Arthur, uh, Lynchburg, the seawall is classified hurricane, as hurricane protection, Galveston, um, at Freeport, and then uh, uh, Matagorda. So those systems uh, all you know, were constructed really you know, um, to protect the industry along the coast. And that's another, another reason why industry feels confident that they can continue to operate and expand because they have a hurricane protection system to, to hide behind. So. And then Addicts and Barker. So right now we're working on the dam safety report for Addicts and Barker. Um, that report has gone to this, we have a senior oversight group. It is a group of uh, dam safety experts that are not affiliated with the Corps of Engineers, okay, um, who do a review of the report. It's gone to those, to those folks. Um, once they finish their review, it will go to headquarters for review and then off to Assistant Secretary of the Army, Ms. Darcy, for her signature. Once she signs off on that report, then we'll be able to budget for repairs in 15 for Addicts and Barker. And really what we're going to do is replace the outlet structures on both of those facilities. That's the plan right now. Um, cost is somewhere around $100 million to do that. But, you know, $100 million, one-time investment, last 60 years, and another 6 to $10 billion in damages averted. Um, sounds like a good investment to me, but I got to convince OMB that that's a good investment to, to be able to keep that moving along. Um, and then we're finishing up SIMS. We've got one construction contract left to, to award on SIMS. Bray's, um, really Harris County has the lead on, on Bray's. Um, we work very closely with Bray's and they do, um, it's a reimbursable project. So they do, you know, as their dollars are available, they'll build a section of Bray's and then we'll go out do our quality control, quality assurance, and then once we agree that it was built properly, then we'll refund the federal cost share to them. Okay, and that's gotten t that's gotten tougher too because um, OMB has kind of looked at reimbursements like that as um, as um, um, not very advantageous. Although we explained to them that you're actually fast forwarding construction when you do it that way, um, they have a different take on that. So um, Green's Bayou right now, that's one that's waiting um, for construction. That's actually designed. Um, we're just waiting for construction dollars. Um, it's got a good BCR, it's about 2.4. So, and anything really around 2.4, 2.5 is, is about the cut line where OMB's been, been cutting off projects. So we're hopeful that uh, we'll see money on that one. And then uh, the last one I'll highlight is the coastal study that's happening, Sabine Pass to Galveston. So really that, pa that study starts um, at the Texas border with the, with the County of Orange and goes all the way down to Brazoria County. And we're looking at the coastline right now saying what can we do to provide both structural and non-structural alternatives to protect the Texas coast, okay? Um, so, you know, I use the example of a, of a layered approach for, for, uh, for protection. So where's a place where we could re maybe replenish a marsh Okay, using beneficial use of dredge material, okay, or using beneficial use of dredge material to extend a beach, 
which we do on Bolivar when we dredge over by rollover pass. Um, so how do you extend the beach, maybe reestablish a dune system that used to be there but was lost due to coastal erosion, okay? And then as you look further back, what are the things you can do um, as a structural alternative? Is there a road that could be raised? Um, you know, do you really have to build a flood wall? Um, what are, you know, what are, the, what are the various options that you have that keep the cost down but yet provide a level of protection? And really, you know, maybe give something back to the environment too while you do that. Uh, you'll hear me say, you can do major economic development projects and reap the benefits for the environment at the same time. And uh, this, is a, one of, this is exactly what we're looking at on this particular coastal study is how do we do that? So um, somebody's gonna ask me about the Ike Dike, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't own the Ike Dike. <laughs> That's a Dr. Merle from Texas A&M, okay? Great guy, he's got his vision of what the Ike Dike's gonna look like. In this study, we will look at what are some possible solutions, Ike Dike type solutions, where would they be, where would be the, I'm sorry about that, where would be, um, where would be, you know, pot, where we, we could construct possible solutions like that. But the bottom line is the Ike Dike's about a, a three to five billion dollar project, okay? And then, you know, just the environmental work that you would alone have to do, um, and the cost of real estate to be able to, to build something that big. What are you gonna do, condemn all the land? Okay, that doesn't go over well in Texas, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's a great concept, but, um, and then, you know, where's the wherewithal for somebody to fund a three to five billion dollar project? and then maintain it into the future. So um, it's something that needs to be put on the table to make people think, um, but I think you also need to look deeper at that problem of how do you finance it, how do you operate and maintain it, and how do you get over the environmental, the environmental hurdles of a project of that mag magnitude. And it's gonna take a lot of cooperation from a lot of different agencies to be able to do that. So um, ecosystem restoration. We got a great project we're doing right now. We, we partnered with the, um, the Nature Conservancy, and uh, at Half Moon Reef, we're building um, it's uh, the uh, oyster bay, uh, the oyster reef reef project that we got there. We've got uh, they brought their uh, Nature Conservancy brought their money to the table, brought their money to the table. We had some federal money that we brought to the table. We worked very closely with the GLO to get a uh, to get a lease um, on this particular piece of land, and probably in, by October we'll start building oyster reef out there. Um, our plan is. Our plan is to build about a half mile oyster reef and then the Nature Conservancy holds a permit to build about another 1.5 miles um, on their dollar. So, great chance to, to partner with that. Um, you know, the ecosystem restoration work that we've done in Galveston Bay is part of the mitigation for the Houston Ship Channel. Um, 4,100 acres of marsh is what they called for. We've built about 22, 2,300 acres right now between Marsh and Bird Island. Um, still have some, some to go on that project, but Bottom line is, nobody was gonna make an investment into 2,100 acres of marsh in Galveston Bay, okay? Um, but by working with industry, you were able to reap the benefits of a major economic <coughs> development project and still get benefits for the environment too. So, you can cut, the, these two can complement each other. Um, and then just some of the work that we've done in the Sabine Pass, the Tom Jackson Marsh, that's a great project that we have with uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. And then again, the coastal study will look at opportunities for ecosystem restoration. It's a lot cheaper to build marshland to knock down surge than it is to build flood wall. So, and then regulatory, you know, just some of the things that we've got going on in regulatory. You know, still have this permit that we're working for, the offshore wind farm that's down near Corpus, Corpus South Padre. Um, that's, they're going through the EIS process right now. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just have a question. How is the drought impacting your plans, is it? The drought? Yeah. I mean, with water levels or anything, does that impact you all or no? <sighs> Not so much on the navigation side. Okay. Now, what I do have, though, that's kind of interesting is I have two, I run two saltwater barriers. Okay, one on the Natchez River and one on the, uh, at Wallaceville. So how many people have been to my little project site out at Wallaceville? 
Okay, right off of I-10, you drive by, you think what you see the Corps of Engineers sign, you think what is that? You cross over the Trinity River. Okay. So at Wallaceville we run a saltwater barrier. And then when in the drought, which really it's been in operation continuously for about the past 14 months, we drop a gate. So that saltwater plug from the Trinity, Trinity Bay, that would come back up the river gets stopped at the barrier. Okay. And you say, why is that important? Because north of the gate um, is the water intakes for Chambers, Liberty County, and the city of Houston. So if you, if you sucked in all that salt water, one, your treatment costs would go up for, I think the city of Houston says their treatment costs would go up by about eight to $13 million a year. Okay. Um, and then literally a lot of that water gets used for irrigation, you know, all the rice that's in Chambers and Liberty County. So if you, you know, you would literally be salting the field. Okay. If you put that salt water out there. So a little tiny little project though that just reaps a whole lot of benefits and then it preserves that saltwater marsh that's or that marsh that cypress marsh that's north of Wallaceville which is really one of the last pristine areas of cypress marsh on the Texas coastline. So if you haven't been out there I highly encourage you to get out there and look at it. Um, we've got a good little project office out there. Um, just some of the things we're working on a regular side. Loose Bayou, you know that's Houston's number one project under capital, capital improvement plan. Um, that's a water diversion from the Trinity River over to Lake Houston. Um, and that's, um, the city already sees how fast it's growing and they need that project now to be able to have water for the future for the city of Houston. So, um, and then uh, of course a lot of different pipeline projects that are out there. You know, Seaway Pipeline is really from, that's one that goes from Cushing, Oklahoma um, into Texas. Uh, multiple districts looking to permit that one. We'll see what happens with TransCanada. Um, and then of course Grand Parkway, which again is the, you know, the, the continued expansion of, of Houston. Um, you know, the infrastructure has to grow before the people get there. And my folks here from Toll Road can tell you what happens when you're trying to do those projects after the people are already there. <laughs> and it's painful, so. Okay, so yeah, and then under emergency management, um, so, so PGL 8499, we talked about those levies that we have. Okay, that's the, that's the guidance letter that talks about, uh, you know, every year we go out. So we built a, the Texas City levy and we turned it over to Galveston County. So if Galveston County owns it, they operate it, they maintain it. Um, if the levy gets damaged during a storm event and Galveston has done all the work that it was supposed to do under its operation maintenance, plan, then federal dollars come available through 8499 to, to fix that. Okay. Um, if the system isn't maintained and it falls out of 8499, then it's the cost of the, of the owner, in this case Galveston County, to, to, to do the repairs. That also factors into your, your flood mapping that FEMA does and then you know the certification process that the counties go through with FEMA to have their levy certified which affects flood insurance behind the levies. Okay, so we work very closely with, with all of our local sponsors to make sure that they stay in the program, that they're doing what they're supposed to do, um, that they're not putting any of those systems at risk. And then, um, of course, we are, the core is uh, FEMA's engineer in a national disaster. So we follow up under what they call ESF3, Emergency Support Function 3. Um, we've got existing contracts for debris removal, okay, a temporary power, um, water, ice, and then um, you know other programs that they call on the Blue Roof program. I'm sure a lot of people remember after Ike, you know the Blue Roof went up. Um, and then if FEMA calls on us, we also do a temporary housing where we bring in the trailers, you know, park a trailer in your yard till you can get your house repaired or rebuilt. Um, and then you know what we did up in New York, um, we had the uh, dewatering mission. We have a special group of folks that handled. Um, tough tasks like that. So, you know, for all the engineers here in the, room, in the room, so you got the Holland Tunnel, which is underneath the harbor. It's flooded, and it's at the low point, it's 230 feet, okay? And now you gotta pump the water back up out to sea level, or above sea level, to get it back out into the bay. Um, you know, some pretty interesting pumps and some interesting, uh, you know, uh, mathematics that you got to go through to make that, that work. And we've got some folks that just, that's their sole function in life is to, is to tackle complex problems like that. So, 
And then Milcon, you know, it's, like I said, we're an enabler to Milcon. We just finished the, the reserve center up in the Woodlands. That's the one, it's Woodlands, but it's a little south of the Woodlands. It's the one right off of 45. Um, and then uh, we're getting ready to break ground on one at, uh, in Laredo. And then uh, we've got the one, the Corpus, that's going on. And then the Corpus Christi Army Depot has recently come to us and said, hey, we've got a bunch of projects we'd like you to work, do some construction management with our folks on. And these are smaller projects. I mean, you know, typically these, these, Milcon, these Milcon projects can go anywhere from, you know, five to $25 million. Um, the work we're doing with Corpus, those are really, you know, $50,000, $100,000 jobs. Um, just because we have, the, we have the level of expertise to oversee that type of work and we have the contracting capability to be able to do that kind of work. Um, and it just saves them, it's much more efficient for them to be able to use us than to try to find someone else. So. And then the Border Patrol work. So we've got the Border Patrol station, that's a shot of the one at, at Kingsville that we're building right now. Um, that one actually will be delivered about, uh, about 18 months ahead of schedule. Um, that was a Satterfield Ponticus um, was the group that built that one. Um, and they're just moving out with that one. Uh, we'll, break, we'll, we'll do the uh, cutting on that, or ribbon cutting for that one on the 8th of, on the 8th of May. So uh, the uh, Corpus Border, Pro Border Patrol Station, it's funny, that one broke ground two weeks before the one at, at Kingsville did. Kingsville will finish up way ahead before, way ahead of Corpus. Just two different construction techniques. Um, two different contractors, one who has a method down and another one who has their own method. Um, but, you know, they'll both finish on time or, or ahead of time, so. And then we're getting ready to build one at Freer and then at Falfurious, we got the checkpoint that's getting ready to kick off. Border fence, you know, we've built a bunch of border fence down in the valley right now. Um, there's another 13 miles that's possibly out there. I, I guess DHS is gonna have to see what they got available for, for money after, you know, the budget gets all worked out uh, on Capitol Hill, so. And then that's us, okay? We're on Facebook, Twitter, Divids. Um, we're online. Let me just thank you very much, uh, Colonel. Um, uh, I just wanted to inform you that this uh, presentation is going to be available on video. So, for that matter, I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot of questions here. If if you don't mind, can you repeat the question? Sure. That somebody asked. So yeah. So it gets recorded on our video. Yeah. With that, <coughs> please. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Paul Sosa, and. Uh, uh, I'm from, originally from Panama. Mm -hmm. I was a member of the board of the U.S. Uh, Panama uh, Commission, Canal Commission, in the late 80s. So I follow very closely the expansion. And one of my worries is that Houston, that has the opportunity to become the gateway to 130 million consumers in the plains that are now serviced by Long Beach like LA, Tacoma, Oakland, Seattle, is gonna lose the opportunity if, it, if they are not compatible with the expansion of the Panama Canal. They will continue to be a local port, as they are for containers. 80% of the containers that move in Houston stay within 200 miles. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the commitment, and I'm sorry that Charlie has left, because this would have been a good uh, uh, engagement of a, a discussion. But I think that Houston is losing a tremendous opportunity. Well, you're asking me to comment on the Port of Houston business model. <laughs> <laughs> His question was, he thinks that Houston is losing um, uh, opportunities in the future because of there are 45-foot channel and Panama is going to be a 50-foot channel. Um, and right now the, the port doesn't have a plan to go to greater than 45 feet. Okay. Um, I will tell you from a federal perspective how we, we look at that, and these are some discussions I've had with Charlie and with, with Len Waterworth, okay? So if you want to take Houston to 52 feet, you've got to extend the entrance of the, canal, of the channel out about 11 miles to get it over the coastal shelf. That's just the entrance of the channel, 11 miles, okay? The port's cost to that is about $200 million, okay, on a, as part of the cost share. Okay, the federal, the federal piece of that is probably close to 600, 700 million, okay? 
So you're looking about a billion, and that's just the that's just the getting over the outer bar, what we call the outer bar. And then you have the the rest of the channel from the jetties all the way up to Houston that would need to to go to 52 feet. Okay, so and I'm not sure what the cost of that would be. Uh, the discussions I've had with the port right now is said we've got a 45 foot channel. We have not maximized our 45 foot channel. Okay. Um, we want to make investments into our 40-foot channel to maximize what we have before we start looking at channel to the future. Okay, um, we, you know we, we won't take channel to the future off the plate. Okay, with the federal government, um, but we want to maximize what we have right now. So what they got right now is that they're working with me on it, are the permits for Barbers and Bayport. Okay, the main channel Houston is at 45 up to Beltway 8. The side channels to Barbers and Bayport are only at 40, okay? So they've come in now with their permits, okay, the requests. They want to dredge those to, to 45. At Barbers, it's a, there's a channel alignment that'll happen because they want to widen the channel a little bit. And that will better facilitate the larger ships that are going to be coming in, you know, through the, as the, the canal expands. Now, one of the other things I've gotten is on container ships, okay, Container ships tend to cube out before they weigh out, draft out, okay? So if you make the port available for Panamax ships that, are, that can go up to 50, but they're only gonna draft 43 to 45 because of the, they're cubed out already, do you really need 50 and do you really need to make that investment, okay? I mean. Those are things that I'm sure is going through the, every port in a nation's mind right now that's looking at a deeper channel of what's deep enough, okay? I mean, uh, Savannah just came in at 47, okay? And, and, and now they're, they're sitting over there going, you know, the NED was 47, so the National Economic Development Plan, where the nation reaps its benefits, was 47. So, but the port is saying we want, we want 50, so they're, now they're talking about how do I buy, they've got to buy three more feet all by themselves, okay? And what's their cost going to be on that? And then will the federal government assume the maintenance for that deeper channel, okay? Which is another process that you've got to go through for assumption of maintenance, and we're doing that right now with the Port Houston, assumption of maintenance for Barbers and Bayport. So, it's, did I answer your question, sir? Yes, very well. Yeah, I mean, it, there's some business decisions that have to be made out there. Okay, and um, both on the port side and on the federal side, because the, the federal budget has stayed flatline. Okay, and um, you know, even in the times, everybody knows this. Even in the times when you're when you're reducing, you're still making strategic investments for the future. Okay, and the nation has to decide where is it's going to where is it going to make its strategic investments. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's the challenge that we're going to face. In a, uh, face. And I, I will tell you, this is my, my, it's only my opinion, Texas is losing that fight, okay? You're losing that fight to Florida, you're losing it to Georgia, you're losing it to South Carolina, you're losing it to New York. Because there's only so much construction money, okay, every year. And when the construction money goes to Miami, Savannah, Charleston, okay, and New York, okay, there's none left over for Texas. Well, you probably know that last week, uh, Mertz canceled the route from Singapore to through the Panama Canal and changed it to Suez Canal to New York because of the bigger ships, which validates what Panama is doing, but it brings into question what you're saying. I mean, the, the bigger ships are going to bypass Texas. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know that. They're, the shippers are going to go whatever's cheapest, okay? It's, that's the business decision that they make, okay? All, you know, the old saying, build it and they will come. Okay, well, there's some more factors. You can build it, but there's, there's business decisions that we made after it's built to whether the traffic comes here. I mean, I mean it could be, it, on some of that, it's pennies, okay? Um, but what, what I'm saying is those states that I, that I just talked about, Florida, Georgia, they've pulled together Okay, and they've pulled their delegation together on the hill, and they they speak with a voice up there. Okay, in Texas, 
you've got every port pulling for itself. Although Text.Now now has a maritime director, okay? They've they've set up a maritime section underneath Text.Now. That's a good start, okay? And you know, um, Herman Deutsch is a uh, we've 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 met a bunch of times. He's a great guy, but he's 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 wrapping his arms around this beast, okay? And and he's one deep right now. Just him. He's the maritime director directorate at Text.Now, okay? Um, but you know that that voice has got to go all the way through the governor's office, okay, and through all your representatives. I mean, shoot, and look, how big is the state? How many representatives you got in that state? You know, if they if they all come together for Texas, then you got a powerful voice. Whether and what I my experience has been, it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, you're a Texan first, okay. So how do you marshal that support, okay? And you know, you know, they talk to me. And I tell them, you know, all I can do is state requirements, okay? I can't lobby them. They'll ask me, you know, so what are you going to do with $25 million on Houston? Here's the projects I'm going to execute, okay? What aren't you going to do? I'm not going to do this, this, and this. Is it important? Yes. But don't have the funding to do it, okay? Well, how much more do you need? If you wanted me to do this, this, and this, this is how much more I would need. That's all I can say to them, okay? I can't, I cannot lobby, and I won't cross that line. But you all, <laughs> and your voice isn't being heard. I'm telling you that, okay? And you got that on video, so I'm probably in all kinds of trouble. But, <laughs> but you got to you got to stand up for you got to stand up with your your delegation. And let them know what you need, okay? Yes, ma'am. So Chris, could you, could you go back to your slide that showed the deep water um, ports in Texas? Yeah. And it built on one. What about your um, question? <coughs> And I want to thank HJC because this has been fantastic. Um, and I wish we had filled three halls. Um, so when we have these ships with these rankings, if Texas would, if these were turn the numbers into the depths instead of the ranking, so you can see which ones are 52, which ones are 45. Yeah. And if we could all get together and have, you know, this should be, you should be speaking to, um, at uh, Judge Emmett's, uh, conference coming. I have. Okay. And, but then would Texas, if we, if we just got together with all these ports and wouldn't be able to influence the railroads, Joe, to bring all of their freight into Texas? We're no doing great going to LA Long Beach and providing excellent service. And that's after Houston. I mean, part of the issue with the Panama Canal is cost and logistics. I mean, if you're going to the, if you're going to the West Coast, you can turn the ship around faster. You can, you can have more sailings. That's a factor. What are the tolls going to be in the canal? Even with the uh, the deeper canal, the super large container ships are just going to be serving the uh, the, the Pacific the Rim to California or uh, right. Prince Rupert or uh, Oakland. So it's a as the as the colonel indicated, there are a lot of factors in terms of what happens well, with containers. And the, and the railroads aren't going to lay down. Okay. Let's go where the, the best service is too. Well, well, we're going to be implementing a service yeah. between Houston and Dallas. The, the so, double stack? Uh, yeah, double stack service in, in early April. And, you know, the question will be whether it, whether it can be economically su successful because it's a <coughs> short distance and you're competing with trucks that are running up and down 45. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we'll see. But we're, you know, to the extent that uh, Houston becomes a, a, a port that has a lot of business going into the upper Midwest, the railroads are there to try to to try to uh, provide the service needed. But but if if the ports would do it, what you're saying is work together and market Texas together. To they do. The There's a Texas Ports Association, okay, right. which right. which is a group that comes together and, and talks about Texas ports, and they they work with you know TxDOT and the commissioners of TxDOT and others to get their voice heard in the Texas legislature, okay, um, and they. They touch their members, okay. Um, but you know, you look at you look at the member who's out in Midland, Texas, okay, okay, who's sitting on all that gas, okay, and he's going to want to. Where's he going to take it? He needs a pipeline to get it to an LNG facility on the coast, okay, and he needs a channel for that LNG facility to to be able to function and operate. So that's you, you got to kind of broaden the, you know perspective of, of where does everybody touch, okay? How do we get more money out of harbors and, and trust funds? I mean, why are we only getting 25% of the, what we're putting in? Well, some ports don't get anything. If, if you don't want 
if you don't mind uh, just repeating her question. Okay, she asked, how do you get more money out of the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund? Okay, well, you gotta change the law that says that, and this is what the RAMP Act is trying to do, is to release more of that money or make all that money available in a given year. And that money can only be used for maintenance. It cannot be used for capital improvement projects the way the law is written right now. And it can't be used for um, dockside development. So in other words, the ports can't attach that money to do anything, you know, repair a bulkhead or expand their facilities, buy cranes. It's, you can't, it can only be used for dredging, really dredging maintenance, placement area maintenance, environmental sustainability. Um, so, you know, I will tell you that Houston gets about 25 million, okay? Um, the ports on the West Coast, because they're naturally deep, they contribute to it and they don't take any money. They don't get it, they, they get very little money, okay? <laughs> and there's other ports that get, you know, 44 cents on a dollar. And why do they get 44 cents on a dollar? how our political system works, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> you know, another uh, issue that we really haven't gotten to yet is uh, bulk commodities. Yeah. Uh, they're looking to develop at least four coal terminals in the port of Houston to export uh, to either Europe or more likely Asia through the canal. Yeah. We have grain movements today. Yeah. Uh, and that's... Well, ADM is, ADM is Archer Daniels Midland, has made a huge investment in the port of Galveston. I mean, last year Galveston was moving 900,000 tons of soybeans a month. It, it, I mean, they were, they were moving a significant amount of grain that was coming out of the Midwest because they couldn't move it down to Mississippi because of drought had... had right had dried up the river, okay? So they were, you know, you're right. We didn't talk, I didn't talk, and I got another slide, another presentation that shows you, and you know, an impact on the what the gross exports are. You know, grain and rice are right behind petroleum and, dis and petroleum distillates, okay? There's a, there's just, I, and I don't mean to downplay that. It's just when you, yeah. you know, a, a ton of grain, okay, and a ton of oil. Okay, <laughs> they don't cost the same. <laughs> the, the benefits don't reap the same, okay? Um, so that's why I say petrochemicals are the, the big oh, yeah. benefit drivers. Although there's, a, there's other things out there too. I don't mean to downplay that. On that, on that subject, what does it cost? You talked about Houston mm -hmm. to, to a, a depth, uh, a deeper depth. What about uh, Freeport, isn't that? Freeport project's about 300 million to go to 55 feet. Now Freeport's different than Houston because it's, a, it's the closest deep draft port to, uh, to the Gulf, directly into the Gulf, okay? And they've got, what keeps the cost, what, another reason why their project is so low is because they don't have a lot of environmental mitigation issues. Um, you know, back in the 30s, the Corps diverted the Brazos River around the harbor, okay? So, you know, in Houston, you've got you know San Jacinto, Trinity, you know all the bayous and everything like that. Okay, so every time you you do something in that system, there's a mitigation cost. Okay, Freeport doesn't have the mitigation. That drives the cost of a project up really fast. Um, so, yeah. one second, sir. We're going to get him here. Yeah, um, you mentioned the LNG terminals that need the <coughs> extra depth. I guess uh, the full 50, 55. They only need 39. Okay, but the problem is their ships are wide. So they need the, the width on the new, on the new locks, uh, the new set of locks. They only draw 39 feet. Um, and they, they bring them in, uh, Sabine's only authorized a 40 right now, but um, they bring them in up there on a, when the tide's up a little bit, they bring them in up there at 39 feet without a problem. Why so. are the LNG terminals not coming toward the Houston region then? We have that sufficient depth. We don't have the width of the channel. They're going to where the gas is. Okay, you know Corpus, you know Corpus, shot. Eagle Ford. Okay, um, those two, those two up there. You know, um, you've got the shell play. That's there's a there's a small shell play that's happening in Louisiana right now. Louisiana, um, so. What's that? Heinz, Louisiana. Yeah. So you got a, you got a shell play that's happening over there, um, and then it's all accessible by pipeline. And they've already got a five billion dollar investment there that they that they want to capitalize on. So, I mean, Chenier wants. 
I know it's so your time. Event, so if you all can stay around and, and maybe yeah, I, I'll stay here and answer questions for you all. Can you make your presentation available? Yeah. yeah. It's, the Sidro Arena is my, uh, my PAO. Go to our website and on the last slide, the swg.usa.army.no. You click on library and the presentation. Okay. And we will have this video on our website uh, by what, tomorrow? We're going to end the time. We have 48 hours. Yeah. We just want to thank you, Colonel Solis, for sharing. Thank you all.